Hey, welcome to GSA Does That, the podcast that uncovers the stories behind the federal agency delivering effective and efficient government. I'm your host, Rob Trivia, and today we have an episode in store for you that just might lead you down a new career path. Join us as we discuss the future workforce of the federal government. In today's podcast, we have two powerhouse guests joining us, Robin Carnahan, the administrator of GSA, and Karen Ahuja, the director of Office of Personnel Management, or OPM. We'll be asking them about the ever-changing nature of work and just how it's affecting the federal workforce. In our digital world today, the federal government is on the lookout for the best and brightest Americans to join its workforce. But not only is it about finding new talent, but also retaining the valuable employees they already have. We'll be discussing the hiring process, providing tips on how to land a federal job, and talking about some of the benefits that come with federal employment. With the federal government being the largest employer in the nation, there's almost a limitless number of career paths to be explored. We'll discover what GSA Administrator Robin Carnahan is looking for to propel the agency forward, why working for the federal government is such an exciting opportunity, and what OPM Director Karen Ahuja is doing to help retain the best federal employees. Additionally, we'll be shedding light on where you can find job postings for the federal government and learning about the efforts being made to attract the next generation of employees. And we'll talk about why it's never been a better time to consider a career in the federal government. Our guests are transforming their agencies with their vision and leadership. You won't want to miss this inspiring conversation. So join us as we uncover the stories and insights behind the federal agency delivering effective and efficient government. Get ready for another episode of GSA Does That. And don't forget, this podcast is available on all major platforms, so please be sure to follow. For more information about this episode and others, visit us online at gsa.gov slash podcast. Okay, it's time to talk about the future workforce of the federal government. Robin and Karen, thank you both so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, so let's jump right in. Karen, I think under your leadership, OPM is maybe more out front than ever. What are some of the things OPM is doing now to recruit and retain the very best talent? Thanks for the question, Rob, and it's good to be here, I think, on uh, the early, newer or new version of, of, of GSA podcast. Or I'm very excited to hear um, that all is going well and as you build your listener base. So uh, hopefully we're going to contribute to that with an interesting conversation. Uh, I love how you framed it, that OPM is out and about. We very much have worked to uh, build our profile as an organization. Certainly a lot of our work is happening in and around the government, supporting our partner agencies. But we also know being the largest workforce in the, in the country at 2.2 million, and that's what we're clocking at right now, It's uh, we know that we can have um, a huge impact. Um, and we have federal employees in literally every single county in this country and 85% of our workforce that's outside of Washington, D.C. So um, it's important about how we think about really drawing the best and brightest, um, the top talent across the country, those who want to uh, commit themselves to the incredible mission here in the federal government. I will say that first, you know, we're thinking about kind of the, fr- we think about this in really three phases, which is like the front door uh, about attracting uh, the best talent, um, how we're managing kind of in the middle, which is like the policies and processes. And then at the end, how are we really thinking about keeping a lot of these great individuals um, in government? I will say on the front end, we're like revamping our our website right now, and so we're creating these personas where if you're interested as as a as a as a potential federal employee, you can find all the information on our website, making it a lot more streamlined to to get that information as a potential uh, new federal employee. And certainly, if you're already in the federal government, making sure that you understand all the great benefits that you have as a federal employee and reminding you of that and making sure you're taking advantage of those things. I will say on uh, kind of the front door aspect of recruitment, USA Jobs, that has been doing a lot of upgrades. We've got actually specific talent portals focused on uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the infrastructure work that's happening across this country, and a lot of jobs that we're trying to bring in to the federal government. We've got uh, job portals focused on STEM and also national security, as well as early career talent. So making it a lot easier to find the jobs that interest you um, by focusing on those search terms and by on those portals where you can just see all those jobs in one place. The middle piece, as I think about it, is how are we just making the process incredibly easier um, and more functional about 
once you'd apply, like how we move you through. Um, and one of those things is uh, what we call pooled hiring actions, so multi-agency hiring actions. You know, we can we can hire at scale, and we haven't. Um, and we're investing um, in that work. GSA actually, Robin knows this, was really out in front and doing one of our first pooled hirings because listen, if you're interested in contracting in government, you'll think about GSA. GSA is going to attract probably, you know, really the top talent in that area. All of us are vying for the, the kind of talent that they would attract. And so, you know, having GSA as an agency lead out, uh, initiate that hiring action. But, you know, there's a lot of potential uh, candidates on that certificate um, and on that list. They may not be able to hire all of them. Why not share that with the rest um, of the federal government? So we want to start doing that with a lot of critical positions and and we are certainly moving forward with that. We're also pushing agencies to start to look at skills-based hiring, um, focus on skills. You know, it doesn't matter like what college you went to or where you got your experience, but the fact is you've gained that experience and then how can we utilize that? And certainly in the tech talent space, we've seen that sector as a leader uh, and really being able to set the tone for how we need to apply that across the federal government. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, because we can have a conversation about this when, when I think about kind of the end piece of this is everything we can do to keep the talent that we have and and, and really making the case about the great benefits packages that, uh, that um, federal employees have. Um, there's a real focus right now um, on employee engagement. Um, you know, we've got a lot of shifts happening in the workplace. So we're, we're taking a real data-driven approach with our federal employee viewpoint survey to take that and look at it and get agencies to really uh, utilize that information um, and then uh, then think about ways to really address maybe some of the challenges um, that they have in their organization to show that they're listening to their employees um, and they want them to uh, want to make sure that there's uh, there's an important feed feedback loop there and that again not every place is going to be uh, hitting it right every single time but you know as long as there's a commitment um, to work on those issues I think is important and that communication is important. So let me stop there and uh, hand it back to you, Ross. Really interesting information. I think I want to touch on a few things that you mentioned. One was the bulk hiring. Is So has that started or is it not? I know Robin is probably pretty... Robin, are you... What are you doing with bulk hiring? Is that a part? Is that just with OPM or is that just GSA do that? Yeah, look, trying to make hiring easier uh, and getting people into, into the government workforce is a high priority for everyone. We are really... Appreciate the partnership with Kieran and her team at OPM to to do this. You know, traditionally there have been lots of hoops you have to jump through, and typically, if you have somebody who you need a building manager or you need a contracting officer, each division might put out their own, you know, job description and say what they need. When in fact, we have dozens or you know a hundred people that we need for those kinds of jobs across GSA. And so one of the things we're trying to do is do these hiring pools, right? So that we can talk about if you're a contracting officer, there are lots of different opportunities at GSA. You don't have to apply for each one of them individually. And that once you get into the pool, uh, not only can people uh, at different in different parts of GSA select off of that, but maybe people at other agencies can as well. So if we could do that, it's a much quicker way uh, both for the applicants, and it's a lot easier for them, but it's also easier for agencies to get qualified folks into government faster. Is that eminent? Is that coming? Yeah, we're doing that in a couple of areas already. And Kieran, you want to talk about a few specific job categories? Yeah, it's already underway, Rob. It's well underway. Um, we're, we've done, a, you know, Robin mentioned, I mentioned earlier, you know, we let out on um, some of the hiring that was spearhead, spearheaded by GSA, or you know, focused on contract specialists. We've also done full hiring actions for uh, human resource specialists. We are working on program or project management for data analysts. We're taking some of those jobs that we know exist across like all these different agencies and really trying to maximize um, both the efficiency for the HR professionals, right? Because it takes away the burden of doing a job announcement for every single one of these jobs, um, as well as the burden on the applicants. So you have an opportunity to apply at one time to multiple jobs across the federal government if you are interested in being a project manager or a data analyst. And maybe you don't have you know, this strong desire to be in this one agency. Certainly that may, may be true for some folks, but if you want to do that kind of work, 
um, there are multiple opportunities um, to have to be able to have that experience um, by going through these full hiring actions. And we make it clear in the job announcement, you know, that this will be uh, something that, you know, that we, will be shared and opportunities across various agencies that are participating in the pool of hiring. Robin, I don't know if there's anything else that you all are planning um, at GSA. Yeah, there, there's one in particular that we just, uh, I think, wrapped up, and that's around designers and, and content people. So if you think about so much more of people's interaction with government these days is online, and whether that's through a website on their computer or whether that's on your telephone, and we need to have folks who are good at designing those processes and also the content, right? It turns out that the language that you use can make it easy or hard uh, to be able to navigate that thing. So we just recently wrapped that up and and um, uh, and hired a, a group of people who were going to be deployed at different places around GSA, but did that at one time. So that's a great example of, as Kieran said, sort of skill sets that we know we need in a lot of places. And we're just trying to get folks who've got those skills to make it easy for them to say yes to joining government. And Rob, I was going to say that, you know, I think what what Robin's pointing out also is that, you know, in these larger agencies, you can do that within your agency and it's just like efficient in that regard, or we can take it and do it across government. Uh, and, and, and again, I think it is, uh, we're always looking for agencies who are willing to step up like GSA and say, we will, we're, we're willing to sa- share our job list, our, our, our candidate list, our cert, as we call it in the federal government. And um, and willing to, we're we're always looking for those agencies to kind of volunteer and say we'd love to be able to one be out there in the lead because we know we can attract. Let's say for DHS cybersecurity, they're going to you know be a huge draw for those individuals who want to do that kind of work. But cybersecurity specialists are needed all across government, um, and we need that talent. Um, and so this is a way we want to maximize and use agencies that are already out in a very competitive way, maybe with other agencies. Um, and, and and ask them to step forward so we can use, uh, we can share the, that candidate list across the federal government. It sounds like there's more opportunity than ever with the federal government. And it really does. Um, it's just so c- critical to our country. You know, as the largest employer in the country, the federal government has had an historical role in building middle class. I'm curious, Karen, do you think that's still relevant today? Absolutely. I, you know, we talk about we want every federal job to be a good job. And that means, obviously, pay is a living wage, uh, uh, or even better. You know, we want to continue um, to stay stay competitive. So even though we know we do have challenges around competing um, around pay, um, it is a um, it is a job that w- we seek to make sure that we can we can uh, incorporate other benefits that, that we know are important to you know our workforce or those who want to come in um, to the federal government. We've talked. You know, we mentioned earlier or talked earlier about, I, I do think that uh, the fact that you can do meaningful mission-oriented work in the federal government uh, is a real draw for us, uh, as well as the benefits package that we provide. So I, I think we see it in a very holistic fashion, as well as the workplace flexibilities and the work-life balance. I think we're seeing post-pandemic or even the all, all that we've experienced through the pandemic that uh, it's a mix of things that we want when we think about um, what it means to have a fulfilling job. What does it mean to be um, supporting people uh, um, to live um, prosperously and to um, to feel that they're economically secure? And also, you know, there is work that we're doing around um, really improving pay um, in the federal government. You know, we don't have OMB here joining us, but they've been a really big champion and proponent in increasing um, pay over the past couple of years to ensure that we can really close that pay gap in certain instances. And I would say for OPM, we're working specifically with agencies and 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 really trying to push out and publicize really that agencies can come to us if they want to create special pay rates for specific positions or specific geographic areas. So really trying to make sure folks have the tools as well as there's recruitment and retention incentives. So there's really a whole toolbox of how we want to think about supporting our workforce and retaining them, certainly recruiting them. Um, but again, I think, you know, we want to live and, and continue to really double down on the idea that the federal government um, for a long time has been an organization um, that has put a lot of, of um, support and stock and what it means to support its workforce. Um, if you think about it, we created a pathway 
for the middle class and the African American community in many communities across this country and other communities of color. And I think it's important because those then create opportunities for like multiple generations. And then we actually see many people who have had parents who worked in the federal government that they themselves came back in to the federal government or saw that as like, wow, I saw what my parents gained from that experience. I also want to be able to have a similar experience. Yeah, I like what you said about we want people to understand it's a good job. Not every job out there is a good job. And it, I think the jobs that the federal government offers are good jobs. They do pay well. They do have great benefits and they can be career jobs. And I think one of the most interesting and fun things about working for the federal government, in my opinion, is the ability to move around in your career to do different things and not go backwards. You actually continue to move forward and with your pay, with your opportunities, with your responsibility, and move along these different agencies. And, and Robin, you lead an agency that executes billions of dollars. How do you think federal investments contribute to the middle-class American? Yeah, so that's the other side of the coin. Like, obviously, we need uh, we need a lot of talent in the government to be able to deliver for the American people uh, and in the ways that they expect. And your point about it being a, a stable career and a place to really grow uh, I think nowadays is particularly compelling for people because there's a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, and in the government, you can continue to grow those skills and like move within your own agency or, or other agencies. And so I think that was a useful point to bring up. Uh, but you ask about like the federal government's role in, in really developing and strengthening the middle class. And I think it's something, look, at President Biden talks about it all the time. This is a thing that really drives and compels him. Uh, in his public service, and that's to build a stronger economy, to help families be able to have pathways into the middle class. And when he talks about these invest in America agendas and the things we're doing with the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act, and those investments are about creating good jobs, jobs that you can get uh, that are going to take care of your family that don't necessarily need a college degree. And so if we think about GSA's work and the investments that we're making, uh, we've got about almost three and a half billion dollars that we're putting into infrastructure investments on the northern and southern borders. And the jobs that that creates in these communities are really significant. Uh, they're good working jobs. They are often trade building trades and others. And we are looking for union uh, you know, level wages and prevailing wages and all of these projects that really make a difference uh, for these families. And so that's a thing we're doing. And we've got another over $3 billion uh, for sustainability investments. And those, again, those are creating jobs in communities. Those are helping innovation uh, in America uh, with the green energy economy. And so we're pretty excited about sort of the ripple effect, frankly, of uh, what what we're able to do at GSA by the work we do with infrastructure uh, to, to create good paying jobs that, and middle class pathways uh, all across the country. When we think about creating new jobs, we need, we need young people to, to fill them. We need the next generation. I was very, um, it was kind of shocked really. I saw that the, there's a real disproportionate amount of federal employees that are really, they're in their fifties, maybe as many as 80%, maybe as few as eight to 10% that are under age 30. Kieran, what are you doing to attract the next generation? I know those those numbers are really shocking. Uh, I know we also say that you know less than seven uh, percent um, of our entire workforce is, is under the age of thirty. I know you have less than ten percent, but that number is actually a little bit lower than that. Um, and I am actually part of the eighty percent, so I'll just put that out there right now in my in my fifties. So uh, we're the group that predominates, but um, we also want to have that that diversity. Um, of experience. And um, there's a lot that we are doing uh, um, in this um, arena and and working with Robin and others because they've got some great programs underway as well. But I think overall, you know, we've tried to set the tone uh, across federal government that we need to prioritize early career talent and hiring and recruiting those individuals. Uh, we issued a policy um, a number of months back, um, um, OPM and OMB, uh, encouraging agencies to to focus on early career talent and um, that there's specific tenants that they should follow uh, as far as how they think about recruitment um, and also just the development of interns, like really taking time to create programs that give them the right experience that that, that gives the stickiness of them wanting to come back in. 
um, as well as you know doing as much as we can to to go out there and recruit uh, these individuals. I mentioned to you kind of that front door when we were talking overall of recruitment. We've got an internship portal where we've coalesced all the internship opportunities across the federal government, um, continuing to encourage people to um, to go uh, and use that portal and to find the experience that certainly agencies are doing um, if they uh, have separate programs are also doing uh, separate recruitment. And uh, so there's lots of different places that individuals can look if they're interested in foreign affairs. They can go to the Department of State or USAID or if they're interested um, specifically in cybersecurity, well, they frankly can go to every agency. There's lots of great um, opportunities for that kind of talent um, and those skill sets that we need um, in the federal government. I will say that we are also chain making changes to our policies to just make it a lot easier to bring in those individuals um, and create a pathway of what we call conversion to, to, to permanent employment. Um, in the federal government. Uh, what I think is really great, and you were talking about the middle class, and, and if we think about the early career talent, what I also think is an, another interesting statistic is that about 50% are, uh, are, are early career, or are 50% of individuals in colleges are in community colleges, right? So 50% of that student body. So, you know, I think oftentimes we have, we have this, we have this idea of what a college student looks like. And and again, it could be, you could be changing careers, middle of your career, you could be, you know, um, a young parent, you could be, you know, it could be whatever stage of life, certainly kind of early, you know, coming out of high school and going directly into college. There's an opportunity to come into the federal government and get a good paying job while you're in college. Uh, so we have direct hire authorities now um, that allow, uh, you know, an individual to be paid almost $70,000, um, you know, working in the federal government while you're going to school, whether, you know, through an internship program and the hours that you work. So I think we were keeping that in mind of what it means to draw those individuals in, to give them the experience. I definitely think that younger generation cares about mission and kind of having meaningful work. Uh, and we think for, for government, we win on mission every single time. And so that's the message we're trying to get out there. I, I don't forget to mention, Kieran, at least at GSA, we have loan forgiveness, for, I mean, uh, uh, yes. forgiveness programs as well. And so those are really significant for when we talk about the benefits of coming to work uh, in the federal government for early career people, that is a big deal to get your student loans dealt with. Um, I will say on this topic that uh, the early career thing is so exciting to me because as I talk with leaders across GSA, a huge percentage of our top leadership at GSA started out in some internship yep. or fellowship program and have just spent their career at GSA. And so it just sort of goes back to um, if we can if we can keep that pipeline uh, filled, we are going to have wonderful talent with the agency for a long time. Yeah, we I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that you can intern with the federal government with a different with agencies. Uh, so much so it's so important to understand people who can go to intern.usajobs.gov. That's that's really helpful. That gets you right to where you need to be. Um, I think the executive producer of this podcast started as an intern 20 something years ago. So that's exciting. Robin, I think you were just in San Francisco talking with technologists and tech leaders, probably a lot of them that are very young. I'm curious, did you get any additional insights into what it takes to hire technologists in today's world? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, they were the, the folks who came to that uh, session were actually across the board. Some were sort of earlier career, and some uh, had had been uh, in the tech world for a while. The thing that's so interesting to me, particularly about tech talent, is these folks tend to want to work on difficult problems. Number one, and they also tend to focus on things that have a big impact. That's exciting for people in the technology space. Um, and it just turns out in government, we have very gnarly problems and they have a huge, and what we do has a huge impact. So back to what Kieran said about mission, I think that uh, a, lot of, a lot of times uh, these days, as people, particularly post-pandemic, have spent time thinking about how they want to spend time in their life and they want to work on something that's bigger than, than themselves. They want to work on something that's more important than just selling another thing to somebody uh, they could have an impact and improve their community. And so government's really the best place to do that. And so when I talk to technologists, that's usually my pitch is like, if you want to have an impact, here's the things we do. 
Um, and so that's compelling for folks. So that's number one. I think we do win on mission. But what we have to do is make it easier for them to say yes. What I always say is like, how do we make it easy to say yes? If somebody who is, I say, government curious and wants to figure out if in fact this is something that could work for them, we need to make it easy for them to test that out. And so sometimes that's tours of duty that you can get brought in for two years or four years or eight years in a relatively streamlined way. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a career position. Sometimes it's an internship. We have fellowships, uh, one called the U.S. Digital Corps at GSA that we stood up, which is for early career talent. We have another thing called the Presidential Innovation Fellows. And those are term limited appointments. We often love, they stay in government, but it's an easy on-ramp. So we're always thinking about those. And I know Kieran and other parts, uh, folks across the government have similar things. Kieran, is the stem.usa jobs and the tech.usa jobs, what's that yielding? Is it, has it been successful just to get more technologists to apply? That's a good question. We uh, just created that talent portal. So it's a little too soon to say, Rob, on, on how we're doing, but we certainly are collecting the analytics in real time. It was in response to, you know, we started this effort, you know, really early on, probably if, if I think about it, you know, the, the real impetus is when the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, passed. And uh, of course, it was a historic investment in this country of of rebuilding the infrastructure uh, across the country. And, I, and what's interesting is when that law passed, even before that, I, I had all these senior leaders uh, in these agencies like coming to OPM a little bit with their hair on fire because uh, they knew what it was going to take to actually they need to build entire programs in their agencies. They needed to hire a ton of people. And so, I mean, this was like a cross government effort that was happening inside. Like it's not only just like the resources um, that, that are going out of outside of government, the opportunity to create really good jobs um, outside of government as well in state, local government or in, you know, the different sectors like the manufacturing sector and the construction industry. Uh, but how are we going to do that? How are we going to make sure that we accomplish what we need to with this new law? And so that's where we started thinking, okay, we know all these agencies are going to be listing these jobs and opportunities, and we want to really create kind of a funnel uh, and make sure that folks can find those easily. Um, and so that's what we did. And we kind of then riffed on that idea and said, well, you know what? We need to do that for tech talent. We need to do that for early career talent. We need to do that on STEM in particular that does include positions um, focused on uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, but also STEM opportunities across the federal government. And it's been a great partnership, actually, with uh, with OSTP out of the White House, because um, they're very interested um, in ensuring that we're getting uh, top talent in these areas. I will say, just as a footnote, I mean, it's a big footnote, is that we, we are really challenged and competing um, in this area in the federal government. And uh, certainly there's a part of highlighting these jobs and making sure people know about them, but also, uh, you know, what we can do around pay flexibilities uh, uh, within the, these agencies to allow them to be able to compete. Uh, but I think Robin's point also is really uh, critical here is that when we're having these conversations where we know these are hard to recruit candidates because they're being, they have opportunities in lots of different places, is talking about this idea of the kind and the kind and scale of impact you can have, um, and the challenges that are really tough. You know, I think people, you know, if, if you there's a lot of psychology and research around this that people want to, they find work meaningful when it's like they're working on these hard challenges, but they're they're seeing that there is a path forward and there's there's a space for innovation and um, and the real desire and culture within those organizations to to bring folks together to tackle those kind of problems. Yeah, and I think you know it's been mentioned in this podcast that you know this generation is very much mission focused, and I think uh, we're hoping that they'll be thinking about the federal government. Uh, like you said, we win on mission every time. I mean, you're affecting your community, you're affecting your state, your nation, your neighbors. So it's an opportunity there. You know, I want to talk about diversity a little bit, like we talked about the middle class. We're talking about diversity, just the federal government being really leading the way. And I know that is a priority of this administration. Um, Robin, how are you keeping diversity a priority inside GSA when it comes to hiring? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, look, the, the the bottom line is it's government is here to work for everyone. Uh, it works best for everyone if we have 
folks who understand experiences of all Americans uh, that are helping institute programs for all of these Americans. So like everything about that makes sense. And so not only that, but we've also seen every study <laughs> from whether it's the government or, or commercial uh, businesses that the more diverse your workforce is, uh, the stronger your results are. So for every reason, it makes sense. So what we're trying to do uh, is be very intentional about reaching out uh, to communities across the country. We recruit heavily at HBCUs, for example, uh, but we also want to have pathways within the organization for people to continue to, to grow uh, and and uh, and and be challenged in their careers. So for me, it really is just about intentionality and understanding that uh, we're stronger when we have a diverse workforce, and just be thoughtful about how we're going to both go out and recruit, but also retain a diverse uh, workforce and talent. Aaron, how about that with the with the big picture at OPM, diversity and hiring? How how's that a priority for OPM? Absolutely. So I think. Like what Robin said is a perfect example. Um, if I just wanted to make this one point here is that the tone is set at the top. Uh, this president, you know, issued an executive order uh, that focused on how we uh, really support principles around diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and what those activities and and efforts should look like, and requiring agencies to put together strategic plans from not only what Robin talked about, which is kind of on the recruitment side, but also what are you doing to retain and really support that development within your organization. But first and foremost, uh, kind of in this area, like what Robin was sharing, it's like the tone is set at the top. You know, the leadership is committed um, to to ensuring uh, that you have diverse voices and experiences because you know you just will be a better business, a better organization because you can understand the breadth of, of experiences, know how to really focus on what your customers need and the fact is your customers are diverse. So so you need to have those experiences in, inside of your organization. I will say a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, around hiring, um, certainly the focus on early career talent and we think about our demographics within our country. I mean, all of this is part and parcel of, of how we think about building the diversity uh, in the federal government. And and so we're thinking about that across the board, but certainly when it comes to early career talent uh, and and focusing on, on and, and minority serving institutions, HBCUs, uh, the community colleges across the country, we're seeing a major uptick uh, among agent among agencies and doing this level of recruitment, I've, I in many ways I've seen it. It's really unprecedented. And then finally, I'll say you know a, a big focus for OPM because we're the agency that really is driving this initiative across the federal government. Is we support a chief diversity officer council. Uh, the importance of, of establishing chief diversity officers within your organization, which I know GSA as as well, OPM, a number of other agencies um, have those individuals placed to really ensure and at senior levels so that they can do a lot of that work and ensure that whatever Robin or other leaders are espousing and, and wanting to achieve within their organization, that it is that it's coordinated across the organization. You know, we, we're talking a lot about recruitment and, and like, you know, I'm glad we are, but I want to talk a little bit about retention as well. And Robin, turning to you, um, you know, you you get out there, you see, really meet thousands of GSA employees every year. What do you hear from them? Why do they stay with the federal government? And specifically, why do they stay with GSA? Yeah, it's true. Because I, I always do ask that question. Like, how, how did you get here? And uh, what what have you, why are you still here? Um, and it, it is remarkable to me um, how uniform the, the answers are. And it really is about uh, the ability to make a difference. And so to have an impact, to be in an organization where their talents are being put to use for something that matters uh, for the country and motivates them personally. Uh, but also I think it's about culture um, and that we have a, a, a culture at GSA that values uh, empowering our employees. And that's a thing that is, a, is an important value for all of us is to, to empower people to do their best work on behalf of the American people and to give them opportunities to continue to grow and serve. And, you know, I met somebody the other day and she, she'd she been in the government for 40 years. She was about to retire and she started at, you know, the National Gallery of Art and went to the Treasury and went to VA, but came to GSA and just loved it because she was able to really grow and find new areas where she could put her talents to work. 
Um, and I think that that culture of growth is important, but I think also the the culture of for us, uh, we're very, very customer focused. Like that's what drives us at GSA is we want to figure out how to help our agencies, you know, deliver on their missions and save money for the American people. Everyone gets that. Um, and so I think knowing kind of what our purpose is and being driven by that uh, and then having opportunities is is kind of what it takes. Um, none of that happens by accident. And frankly, it doesn't, I don't think, happen because of people like me or Kieran who show up every, you know, whatever number of years and change out. It happens uh, because of the culture of the organization, the people that are there. And it's our jobs uh, when we're here as, as as being leaders for the times that we are to be able to support that and really uh, unblock things and, and help it continue. So yeah, culture is, it's everything at, at every organization, every company. And are you saying, Robin, that the culture in GSA is, is about customer service, but customer service even internally? Is that what you're you yeah, talk about that too. I mean, I that, that I think I think people are very respectful of each other. They know that their job is to to support customers, but internally, uh, they know that there are plenty of people who have internal customers as well as external customers. And so, uh, when we can empower our people to do their best work, uh, that means we're going to get better results for the American people. And I and I, I just have been very impressed at GSA that that is an ethos that goes through every single level of the organization. And for me, that's exciting because I'm somebody who's been in and out of government through my career. I really think that government is a place to make a difference. Um, and that's why I want to be at GSA and want to be in government. But to be surrounded by people who share that is fantastic. I've heard GSA is maybe in the top five of the best agencies to work for in the government the last couple of years. You think that culture is a big part of that? I do. I'm I'm very competitive. I want us to get better than just the top five, uh, but uh, that's not that's that's the result of of, of doing the right work, um, and we're going to continue to do that. Karen, can you talk a little bit about USA Jobs? I think you know people would understand. Oh, it's a website you can go to and find job listings. But I didn't even know this. 1996, it started. That was a little while ago. So, why should somebody go to USA Jobs today? What are they going to find there? What's the best way to make use of it? I appreciate that question, Robin. I, I think this particular uh, website is, I think, ranks in probably at the top 10 of websites and the number of hits that that this particular site gets. And we have, you know, over 30,000 jobs that are listed on USA Jobs uh, that are open um, each day, which is just, I mean, the scale is just incredible. Um, and so I think, again, if you're a candidate, if you're a prospective candidate, it could feel slightly overwhelming. And so I think that's why we've created these portals that I mentioned about really being able to hone your search. But a couple of the things I wanted to mention that are happening that I think are important is that, and we've had this feature on USA Jobs, but it is actually, you know, downloading your resume and having it sit on our website. So, and also making sure that it can be searchable because we're encouraging more and more agencies to use that opportunity to go mine particular lists where they can kind of do more directed outreach um, with candidates to have the background for particular jobs that they're recruiting for. So one, it's yes, you're 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 coming to that website, you're looking for opportunities, but there's also a bit of the the static passive role that you can play, which is like make yourself known, um, and and more of the work that we're doing inside around robust recruitment and best practices. One of those is encouraging agencies to, to kind of mine those resumes um, and do more targeted outreach. Um, so that, so that's one piece of it. I will say uh, another uh, effort uh, that we have underway is that we talked a little bit about the bulk hiring. Uh, we talked about the, this pool of candidates. Uh, so, you know, we've now created that's connected um, to USA Jobs uh, are, are these uh, agency talent pools. So uh, where, you know, you've got these ready lists of individuals who've like participated um, in the hiring process, um, uh, either they're uh, available still on a particular candidate list um, that an agency is making available, or there's opportunities just to see, uh, okay, they, they clearly are showing an interest in the federal government, um, and here's our, their background. And so again, another opportunity to be able to um, share with them maybe a new opportunity that's presenting itself at your agency um, that you want to make these candidates um, aware of. So I think it's a mix of 
don't feel like, you know, you're coming in and doing this kind of one opportunity at a time, right? There's real opportunities for when you make yourself known and visible um, on USA Jobs, that, that there's stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, and those are the things that we're trying to do around the upgrades for USA Jobs, Rob. It's like, I think initially when it started, you talked about kind of how long USA Jobs has been around. It was like a regular job board. I mean, now we're trying to really make it much more interactive. There's videos, there's other content um, to get you up to speed. Uh, and that's our way to say we know. It may feel a bit overwhelming, but we really are trying to make it much more manageable and much more user-friendly. You know, as we, as we wrap up the conversation, Robin, I'm curious first from you, really, why do you think someone should go to USA Jobs? Why work for the federal government? Well, look, Rob, I, I, I'm going to be the biggest advocate for folks to be able to give back to their communities and their country. There are lots of ways to serve. One important way is to be of service as a public servant uh, to, to the folks in your community. And being an employee of the federal government or state and local government is, is a terrific way to do that. I obviously am eager to, and always recruiting people to GSA. I think that we've got uh, an opportunity to have a huge impact on lots of things because we are the agency that helps all the rest of government actually deliver. To me, it's kind of a service delivery business, right? In the end, there's a bunch of policy, but if you can't execute the policy effectively, it's as if it didn't matter. And so that's what is exciting to me about GSA is it really is the place to go if you are interested in getting results and seeing delivery. And whether that's about, you know, whether you're a technologist, whether you're an architect and design buildings, whether you're into sustainability or how do we how do we create a green energy economy? GSA is in the middle of all of those things. Um, what electric vehicles and charging stations. Um, I can keep going on about this, but yeah, people should check out gsa.gov. They should go to usajobs.gov um, and they should think about joining the government. There's really no better time. Aaron, if someone's out there listening, they're, I want to work for GSA. I want to work for one of the top agencies in the country, say they're a project manager and they're young, maybe they're in their late twenties, maybe they got a college degree, they're like, and they've got real experience. What would you tell them? Because it is, it's a little bit gnarly. It's like, wow, where do I start? So they want to be a project manager for GSA. Do they just go to USA Jobs and just start looking or where do they upload the website and hope to get contacted? Do they, is there a recruiter to call? What's your advice? Well, we definitely want folks to start at usajobs.gov take their time perusing, looking at all those opportunities. Uh, you know, maybe they're sitting in front of the TV or at a coffee shop, you know, it's a great way because there are a lot of opportunities there. And to your point, Rob, it, it, it can feel overwhelming there. We mentioned those job portals or talent portals. Um, you can specifically look for STEM opportunities, uh, different search terms. You can, you can find, you can even, uh, we have a new feature where you just want to look for remote positions. You can you can isolate jo the jobs in the government, like focused on remote positions. Um, and one thing I like to say about kind of thinking about the federal government is literally any occupation uh, that you can think of, you can find in the federal government. Um, so it's a place for everyone. And I think, Rob, I'm thinking about getting you on the payroll. I know you're over at GSA, but you're a great proponent. Um, and, and the way you talked about like in being in the federal government and the ability to move around and have that support your career, uh, think about it. I mean, you know, 2.2 million in the workforce, uh, so many different agencies and departments and, and ways to continue to grow and experience and try, try new things. Um, that being said, you know, I am someone who has gone in and, in and out of government. So I haven't stayed in government and I've always been drawn back to it because I always find it's the one place where I'm literally like, you know, in a space with so many people who are so driven and mission oriented, I truly have not had that kind of experience outside of government. Um, so I am biased in that way. Um, but, you know, to what Rob was talking I mean, Robin was talking about earlier about uh, these uh, limited term opportunities where and fellowships where you can come in and try it out. I think there's really, you, can, you know, it's not one size fits all. There's really an opportunity for everyone. And I think our job at OPM has been how to make it easier for anyone out there to try to find the opportunity that speaks to them and feels meaningful. Um, we spend way too many hours in our jobs um, and it's important that we feel that we're giving back, um, that we're valued, that we're recognized for that work, which we really focus on here in the federal government, um, but that we also feel like we're making a difference. Yeah, and, and we didn't talk a lot about this, but I'll close with this. 
I think you t- we started with good jobs. These are good jobs. But I, I want to close with this. The work-life balance, it's critical to a healthy life. And I, I really believe that the federal government is a place you can go and work hard, do very meaningful work, have a lot of responsibility, be paid well for it, yet still have real opportunity to spend doing other things with the people that you care about and just time off. So um, I hope people really look, I hope this podcast really does open some people's eyes and their minds and think, you know what, maybe I'm going to check it out. I'm going to go to USA Jobs. I'm going to take a look. And um, they might be pleasantly surprised. And like you said, there are just, it's limitless. If, if it's something you can do in the private sector, you certainly can do it in the federal government. There's, that's, that's really clear. So, you know, thank you both. I know you are very uh, busy people. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for this discussion. It's been a lot of fun for me. I think it's probably been really enlightening for others. And I hope you um, both continue to have good success in reaching the next generation of federal employees and holding on to the very best and brightest that we already have and retaining them. So thank you both. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you doing this. Yeah, thanks so much. It certainly does seem more relevant than ever to talk about the ever-changing nature of work and just how that affects the hiring and retaining of federal employees. So listeners, I hope you've learned about the hiring process, gained valuable tips on how to land a federal job, and discovered the numerous benefits that come with working for the federal government. And for our listeners out there, remember, as the largest employer in the nation, the federal government is on the lookout for individuals who can contribute to building the most effective and efficient government ever. The opportunities are boundless, and with the vision and leadership of individuals like our guests, the future of the federal workforce looks bright. In our next episode, we'll shift from the workforce to the workplace. Joining me will be three of our top leaders in GSA, Katie Kale, Nina Albert, and Sunny Hashmi, to discuss what GSA is doing to create the most dynamic, customer-centered, and effective workplace of the future, and why workplace means so much more than where you do your job. We hope you follow this podcast so you never miss an episode. And for more information, visit gsa.gov slash podcast. Or to suggest a topic or guest, send us an email at gsadoesthat at gsa.gov. I'm your host, Rob Trivia. Our executive producer is the one and only Max Tempora. GSA Does That is a production of the U.S. General Services Administration Office of Strategic Communication. 